Hey guys, it's Abel here with the Sustainable Self-Development Podcast. And in this episode, I will have Mario Tomic back on for a second interview. I had him on previously on my channel. And at that time, we talked about the psychological triggers that lead us to overeat. And he shared some amazing scientific nuggets about the hidden cues that lead us to consume a lot more food than what we should be eating. And it's been one of my favorite episodes. And as soon as that interview was finished, I knew it right away that I wanted this guy back on my channel at some point to talk more about, um, you know, just general self-improvement and personal development and how we can improve our lives and how we can become a better version of ourselves. Because ultimately, this is the purpose of my channel. Yes, I publish lots of fitness-related podcasts and videos because fitness is, I believe, one important aspect of living a good life. I mean... Maintaining a healthy body is certainly important. Even having a good-looking body is important, even though we don't like to admit it. Uh, but obviously, living a fulfilling, successful, and happy life is about so much more than that. And I really believe that this guy, Mario Tomic, is one of the best people to follow in this regard. The reason I like this guy so much is that he preaches the message that doing great things and achieving great things in life can be done by anyone if you're willing to commit to it and put in the hours that are required to progress and get ahead in life. He's also a super honest and genuine guy. He is upfront about his weaknesses and vulnerability. He will be upfront about his struggles that he goes through. Like in our first interview, he talked about dreaming about pancakes during dieting. You know, these are the kind of not so sexy things that most gurus and fitness professionals don't like to talk about, which is understandable because these are not the kind of things that we like to tell about ourselves, but yet these things are part of the reality many times. I think Mario's work ethic is also really exceptional. I mean, he uploads a video every single day on YouTube, which are high quality and informative videos as well. So it's not like he's just uploading some random selfies of him rambling on about some topic that he just pulled out of a hat. And besides this, uh, he has a very successful coaching service where he coaches and mentors people to become better versions of themselves too. So he's a very successful and very inspirational guy and I wanted to pick his brain about his philosophies on living a good, fulfilling and successful life. And of course, he did not disappoint. So if now approaching the new year, you need some inspiration, you definitely want to listen to this interview because we really try to break it down how you can take massive action and take your life to the next level. So I hope you enjoy it. Also, you might want to stay tuned until the end where I will share some summary key points from this interview and what we could learn from this, which you might find interesting. Again, use the timestamps in the description for navigation purposes if you're watching this on YouTube. And let's get into the interview with Mario Tomic. So um, you've been on my podcast before and it's been an awesome episode. We talked a lot about uh, how to optimize your eating behaviors to make uh, sticking to a diet and a good caloric deficit easier. And now we're going to talk about uh, kind of a different topic, which is be somewhat related, but it's behavior change and kind of philosophies for success. And um, I mean, when people are look, looking at your online presence, uh, we can see a successful YouTube channel. Uh, you put out a video every single day. We always see your thumb thumbnails where you're very ripped and you're usually uh, checking in from some nice Mediterranean place uh, these days. And you also have a nice coaching service. So um, just for the listeners, how does a typical day in the life of Mario Tomic look like these days? Um, how does it all happen? Well, I can run you through a uh, sample day. And the first, I, I want to thank you for bringing me on, on this specific topic because we, we did dive into the caloric deficit and the nutrition and part of that, which is an amazing skill set to have. Uh, and I personally think that a lot of people would benefit more from actually investing in, uh, in success and personal development than in just going into a one specific domain, at least for the majority of people who don't want to be coaches of this particular um, field, you would be much better off by spreading yourself a little bit so you know the general success methods and also, I mean, the, 
the reality behind what it takes to be successful, and first we're going to define a little bit of what success really is because that's, that's the first thing you have to define before you can even talk about this. And um, yeah, sample day of a guy who's doing daily videos really is about daily videos. And it's um, nothing glamorous. I mean, I wake up in the morning, I have a little morning ritual. Uh, morning ritual is literally just weigh myself, send the data to my sheet where I have tracked my body weight for the last two years <laughs> every day. And then I walk <laughs> um, to uh, just nearby, get some water and get out in the sun which is the fast way to wake up. So I make sure to get, get some sun exposure into the eyes as soon as possible. Even if it's raining outside, I'm gonna still do it. Because the amount of lux, the intensity of the light outside is much stronger. So I get, get up very, very fast. I'm not a very early riser. So a lot of guys have this myth that you have to wake up 5 a.m. You know, if you wanna crush it. Uh, that actually depends on the type of uh, person you are. Some people are those night owls like myself. I am the most productive let's say after 8 p.m., right? So if you are the most productive in the morning, you probably wanna wake up at like five. For me, if I wake up around 10, I'm, I'm okay. Uh, then um, after that exposure to the sun, I'm gonna go take a cold shower, which is uh, simply to push myself in the right direction, to nudge myself outside of the comfort zone a little bit. It's just a small nudge. It's not that I'm gonna take that cold shower for 45 minutes, right? It's just gonna be two minutes just to get a little bit of a shocker, get that adrenaline up, basically wake up, sit down, do research. Research means that I'm gonna uh, devour journals, articles, blog posts, Facebook posts, comments, uh, sit down, every, make breaks every 15 minutes, think about the topic, revise, try to uh, dig into books, podcasts, audiobooks, interviews. I'm, I'll literally, when I take a topic, I'll break it down from all angles. That's about two hours <laughs> and uh, then I'm gonna have a break for, for food because I was all this time I was fasting I didn't get any food uh, typically and then um, I'll have some food and while I'm doing the food thing I'm actually gonna be thinking about the topic and I'm gonna be visualizing rehearsing how I'm gonna create that video so by the time I got to the fact that I'm recording a video I've already gone through the video in my head about 300 times so when I didn't do this, here's the consequence of not doing that. I would go at the spot where I was supposed to film and there I would have to rehearse and I would spend three hours filming. Instead, I'm just using my mind to simulate the scenario and I just repeat that as many times until I get the, the right content and then when I reach the point of filming, I can just bam, it feels like it's what the hell, you know, the content is just flowing. But because I've already practiced it 300 times in my mind, and sometimes I walk there to the spot and with, with my camera man or someone who's like walking with me and they're gonna be like, why are you not talking? Why are you not saying anything? While, while I'm walking there, I'm thinking about the topic. I'm running the video through my head. Right, so when I reach the point, I can just bam. And uh, yeah, that's um, after the video is done. It's usually a, a time block where I take a little bit of rest, maybe get a pre-workout meal, some protein snack, usually about 30 to 40 grams, hit the gym. After the gym is editing, if I'm not doing the editing, if I have someone else help me out, it's gonna be uh, either reading books, learning more, uh, it's gonna be thinking about the next day what I'm gonna talk about, or if I'm lucky, uh, maybe an hour of, uh, of free time, which is free. And in the meantime of all of this, what I'm talking about is, um, is coaching. Because all my clients actually have me available 24 seven on their phone. So, I make sure that I'm, oh. I'm sometimes replying to client requests while I'm filming a video, right? I'm just, I take a break and I reply. And the reason why I'm doing this is um, I don't wanna be the barrier, I wanna be the obstacle, right? So I'm not the obstacle. If someone actually has an yeah. obstacle, they can just text me, bam, problem solved. And people that work with me, they, they are literally in the mode like no excuses because it's not the information anymore, right? Now I have to just make myself uh, do it and that's uh, that's kind of how, how it evolved and I like this approach although it I pay the price for that Increased stress and anxiety and then lack of focus running me out of the flow But it does help other people a lot more to achieve the results. So yeah, it's kind of a trade-off always There's always a price to pay right right so, it's kind of a typical day. I get about eight, nine hours of sleep. Uh, there's a lot more tiny things happening throughout the day. Uh, like walking to the gym, I take a 
take an audio book and these small things that I've developed over the course of years as, um, as habits that allow me to, to kind of stay in the loop on everything, not to miss out. Yeah, that is uh, your morning routine is pretty intense, though. How long did it take you to develop this? It, it actually uh, it started pretty heavy when I was first introduced to the concept of the morning routine. I was uh, obsessed with like having this perfect routine. I would add 15 other things to do. It would be wake up, uh, take my uh, journal, like write out the goals, like think about the goals, visualize yourself five years from now, 15 years, 50. Think about how you're going to die tomorrow to motivate yourself. Watch a motivational video. I had this huge list of things to do. And um, that's great, but I would find that I would spend a lot more, yeah, I'll spend a lot more energy on, on actual planning than on execution of the things that I have to do. You burn out. So I kind of condensed it into, okay, let's minimize the process. And if there is some kind of goal setting happening, which we're going to talk a yeah, bit about, yeah. I'm not a big fan of goals uh, after a while. I'm more, much more process oriented, but I do like to have a direction that my day is going to go in. And that's typically planned the night before. So that's not planned the day at the, when stuff is supposed to be happening. That's not when I'm planning, right? That, that's where I want to be executing. The planning is done after the fact, like after the execution, after the battle, then we can kind of review and see what's going on. Yeah, yeah. yeah I guess uh, I should be calling this like motivational seminar syndrome or something when people get really fired up <laughs> about some motivational speaker and then they try to implement these crazy complex routines and that like burns them out within two days. I fell victim for this so many times. I can't even tell you. <laughs> um, but um, okay, so uh, just for a second, let's get, let's get back to your uh, YouTube channel because um, just just for the listeners, uh, you just posted something on your Facebook page the other day, which talked about how people kind of underestimate the commitment that it takes to post a YouTube video every single day. Um, because I mean, obviously, everybody knows that yeah, you're making time for it in your schedule and stuff like that. But could you just outline? what kind of like a mental commitment it really takes to produce something every single day without exceptions? Yeah, uh, that, that's a great question because I, I actually haven't been asked this question many times, which I assuming for one reason people would have an idea of how it looks and how it feels and how it goes. And they don't, I mean, they're not interested in actually learning because it feels easy. You know, you see that iceberg, you know, see the top videos posted has the perfect thumbnail, has a well-researched article title, has the whole video summarized in the description, which is 5,000 characters, has all the ta right tags, has all the right social media stuff attached to it, has the right topic, it is researched, it's evidence-based, all the resources are linked in the description, and things like that, right? And you see that top of the iceberg, <laughs> which, uh, yeah. The, the, the whole thing happening underwater is an insane amount of time spent in actual research of the topic. Also, the internet marketing skills required to actually recognize a topic and a trend and find something that is relevant that people want to hear from. And those who are true followers, let's say my channel, who've been there for a long time, they know that I don't like to waste people's time, right? I'd, my videos, if you, if you watch the video, you're gonna get value out of it. Like there's no way I'm gonna make a video about my, 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 about my cat, right? It's not gonna be like that. It's gonna be a video about a, an evidence-based um, or, or an ex highly anecdotal backed up uh, concept that you can apply immediately, right? If you just simply apply it right now, you're gonna get results, right? And that's what the, the point of the channel is, is to not, waste people's time. I don't do daily vlogs uh, style of, uh, hey, here's me waking up, here's my selfie, here's this and that. No, it's here, here's the information, right? So I combine the actual information that is usable, which resonates with a lot of people who are not looking for entertainment purposes and they're not on YouTube to, to uh, I mean, they're not on my channel to entertain themselves. There's plenty of entertainment out there. And um, <laughs> this takes an enormous amount of effort uh, on the part of uh, just the research, but also mental effort. I think people miss the picture of how other people around you are affected by you having the camera with you all day. I don't know where my camera is right now. It's down in, in the other room I was going to show you. I literally have a camera that I carry with me everywhere, everywhere. I don't go to the toilet without mm -hmm. my camera, right? And um, <laughs> it is always on. And um, people around you are getting affected by the fact that you're, you're constantly filming 
they're uh, being inhibited by that. Uh, people around you are being affected by you being stressed because you have to deliver daily, very high quality, and you have to improve it. It's not just that you have this small video you post and that's the skill level that you're at. No, it's always supposed to be improving. You have an enormous amount of pressure put on yourself by yourself. It's not that anybody else is putting this pressure on me. I just wanna make that clear, right? It's not that the YouTube audience or people or my, my family or my friends or anybody's putting this pressure on me. Hell no, it's just me putting pressure on myself. Because I know that there's this potential and I know that everybody has this, some potential. I mean, probably not the same. But there's potential in me that I can see, hey, I can do this, and this is the price. Am I willing to pay the price? And so far, I've been paying the price. Sometimes, I mean, right now I'm doing this call. I, last night I had a huge fever. I still have a fever. I'm, I'm sweating, right? I'm still gonna do a video today. I still went to the gym last night. I don't, I don't care, right? I'm just gonna go to the gym. I did like 135, that's 60 kilos and running a deadlift. I couldn't do more. The barbell was slipping under my hands because I had like 40 degrees Celsius when I was there, right? And I was still gonna do the workout. Oh man. And, um, and I, I, I don't care, right? I'm, I'm pushing my, myself to the limit of uh, where it is literally a point where I can say, well, I did everything that I could. Like 100% real with yeah. myself, I did everything. And uh, that one day when I think back when I'm 70, 80 years old, hopefully, I can say, okay, these are, this is the period of your life when you started taking shit seriously and you didn't live like you're gonna live forever. Right, you started living to, to the fullest that you can, and that's it, right? Nothing more than that, <laughs> but that's a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, well, first of all, I, <laughs> I feel really bad for like having you like interrogate it here, but uh, yeah, well, I, I appreciate your presence here even more knowing that you're actually sick and you sound great, by the way, given that you have fever, so congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> I just ignore it, right? I just ignore it, I, I, I totally ignore it. Like, I mean, I know it's not a good medical piece of advice and if you truly have a fever, go consult a doctor, don't be an idiot like me, but I just ignore it because I know that I, I trust my body that's gonna handle it, right? I do the best I can and what is outside of my control, I ignore it. And that's, that's my philosophy, right? I completely cut out the things that I can't control. What is in my control, healthy nutrition, water intake, decent room, everything is under control, right? So now I can chill out because I've done everything that I can, right? Yeah, yeah I mean, it's um, when, when something comes up that you cannot really control, it's you can always choose to dwell on it or to just kind of ignore it. And either choice is fine, but by dwelling on it, you just make it 10 times as bad as it already is. So there you go. Um, so what I would like to ask you is, um, you obviously now, um, a successful, uh, person, um, with your coaching practice and with your online presence and YouTube channel, which is already almost at 60,000 subscribers as we speak here. And what I would be wondering it about is if you could pin it down to a couple of things over the last couple of years, what would you attribute your success to if you had to like summarize it in a couple of points obviously it's never really quite possible but what would you say yeah that's a great question because we don't necessarily know what the exact definition of success is right i mean tony robbins has a really good yeah. definition which is basically uh doing what you want to do when you want to do it where you want to do it whatever person you want to do it with as much as you want to do it right so let's like pretty much having absolute freedom. And that's, I guess, the closest definition to success, what I would say is just having that freedom, right? I mean, I can choose now to do daily videos or I can choose to go on a beach right now and chill out for a couple of months. Like I can choose that if I want to, but I'm choosing the harder thing, but I have the choice. And I think that's, that's one big part of success is just having that freedom of choice, both physically and mentally to do whatever the hell you want to do, right? So that, that's kind of just to define it. And um, just so people know what we're talking about, I'm just talking about freedom. And um, when, when we're talking about mm -hmm. actual skill sets, I don't think I'm like uh, in, in any way talented or blessed with anything except for the fact that I'm very, very persistent, right? That's my only skill that I would say that, that led to inevitably developing certain skills that will help me. It's just pure persistence. And when I say persistence, I don't mean like just head through the wall, I mean, that I am executing on pure belief when I don't see the result of my effort, right? So I don't see the actual outcome because it's easy to put in work and effort and time and dedicate yourself to something that where you can see the end result, 
Like you can see, you can get positive feedback, you can get comments, you get people yeah. telling you, hey, this is awesome. But it's absolutely not the same thing as what you have to do, which is just put in an enormous amount of effort with no guarantees that anything that you're doing is actually going to be seen, appreciated, or valued by anybody else. So it's running on pure belief. I would say that's the biggest skill set that um, is probably why I'm here right now. Uh, people are not necessarily familiar with my whole story, which is uh, written on my blog, which if you're interested in shockingfit.com, there's my transformation story there where I actually talk about how I started uh, five years ago. And I mean, aside from the fitness stuff where I was completely out of shape and everything, uh, my, uh, my skill set that I had to create a financial income to do anything, there, there was none. And I started first by learning English, right? So I had to learn English to be able to communicate with the rest of the planet, right? So that's the first thing. So let's do that first. Then mm -hmm. after I mastered that, I went on to a site called Fiverr and I was writing articles. After I got a little bit of proficiency in English, I went on Fiverr writing articles for $3 an article, 750 words in English for companies in the UK and the United States mm -hmm. to learn and to improve my English. Right, so I mastered that. It wasn't so much for the money, although I needed the money as well because I was broke and I was living with my parents, right? And there was no income whatsoever. And um, then I was doing that and then eventually kind of led to me developing that skill set of writing. Then I started a blog, which is called shockingfit.com. Kind of one thing led to another, but I realized um, after a while that investing in skill sets is probably a better idea than uh, trying to do something that uh, well, I would say thinking about what you're going to do. When you're thinking about what you're going to do, that is almost like trying to go at it backwards. Going at it forward would be, okay, what are the skill sets that I'm going to need regardless of the fact what I'm going to do in my life? So a lot of people are questioning now, what's my purpose? What do I need to do with my time? Is fitness for me? Is personal development for me? Is this or what? What am I going to de dedicate my life to? Instead, you're probably going to be better off if you work on skill sets that are universally needed for anything that you do. And then in the meantime, you can also try to find yourself. Things like social media, things like um, having decent skills in English, probably useful, right? If you're not a Engli native English speaker. Uh, mm -hmm. Things like public speaking, expressing yourself, learning social skills, meeting people, uh, having read a lot of business advice out there. Even if you haven't applied it, you still understand how business works. Uh, the uh, brainwashing yourself that that having financial success is somehow bad or getting out of social conditioning that is telling you that there's only one path of living a life which is go to school do this and that you get a job and then you work for a job and wait for the magical retirement here and then die uh, you got, gotta get yourself out of that and realize the actual nuance and then if you combine that with persistence and a bunch of these little tiny skill sets, it kind of falls into place. At least it's fallen into place for me, right? And I, I, I don't know if I would have been as passionate if I chosen a completely different field to master. I don't know that, but I, I feel like a lot of uh, people in their 20s, in their early 20s, have a lot of room to play around and just figure out what they want to do. And that's what 20s are for. If you, I think you read, I'm pretty sure you read Robert Greene's Mastery. I know you mm -hmm. have, yeah, um, yeah, that's, yeah. that's his, uh, one of the most famous books he has. And his philosophy, I mean, he wrote that book when he was in his late, late 30s, right? Yeah, it's something yeah. like that, it's like early 40s. And um, he says himself, like, I couldn't have written this book when I was in my 20s, like, it just doesn't work. I need the life experience, like, you cannot do that because you need to try so many things before you understand how the world works. And of course, we can try a little bit faster with every year and with technology as it advances, but there's still time necessary to, to know what you want to do, right? It takes some time. But yeah, it's a little bit of a tangent here, but I... <laughs> no, it's, it's, I, I love it actually because it's almost like when, you know, like people who, I mean, in the beginning when they start weightlifting, for example, nobody knows what the fuck they're doing in the weight room. But people still make good gains because simply by showing up and just throwing a whole bunch of weights around, they will just scorch through all the newbie gains and basically they will look pretty decent within two years, even though it's not scientifically based. 
and it's almost like a serendipitous <laughs> effect if you you're and what you're describing is persistence and even if you're not really sure what exact skills has to develop and you're not really sure exactly what the purpose of your life is and what to focus on if you're just Cal Newport actually in one of his books called this bulk positive randomness which I, I love like that concept because it's like just expose yourself to a lot of opportunities for good things to happen to you and if you're persistent and um, just making sure that you're doing something then by definition something good will have to come out of it so is it kind of what you're describing here if I'm interpreting it correctly yeah, I'd say, I mean, showing up is, is the default. If you're not showing up, you, you're losing by default, right? So that, that's the first prerequisite of anything is to actually show up there. And a great resource on what I call persistence is um, research by Angela Duckworth on grit. She's done yeah. an amazing uh, stuff when it comes to that whole realm of persistence and how to actually, um, how to actually understand why is it so important for success. And yeah, as you said, I mean, it is about showing up, but at the same time, when you're showing up, you're, you can see before you try, you don't know what you like, what do you want, what do you care about, what is, is looking like something that you could do. Maybe in like 10, 15 years from now, I'm going to be doing something completely different. I don't know. It's not very likely. It's not very likely because I really enjoy what I'm doing right now, but you're changing and it's okay to be changing. It's okay to be shifting it's if you, I mean, if, even if you look at the greatest companies, let's, let's just look at companies, how they've evolved over the years. Let's say look at Sony, right? They started with producing something completely random and now they're doing cameras, right? And Samsung is producing boats. Now they're most famous for their phones, right? IBM was producing some random stuff. Now they're doing this, right? That everything is evolving over time. And that's how you, as a person as well, you have to kind of, be able to, to adapt, right? Adapt over time and see where you're falling. And you're gonna naturally be falling into something that is drawn, you're gonna be drawn through some, to something based on the fact that you just enjoy it more. Yes, you, you're following that pleasure a little bit there, but you're still producing value. Producing value and, and showing up is by default necessary. If you're at your home, if you're locked up in your basement, if you're not putting yourself out there, uh, you have no chance, like you literally have zero chance uh, to, be, to make it in at least what we're calling success. If your definition of success is staying at home and you're happy with that, and if it's just chilling out or watching Netflix and not being bothered, that's totally fine, right? But what we're talking about here, you cannot achieve by doing those actions. So something else has to happen, so yeah. Yeah, and um, now, you coach a lot of people and as far as I understand, you are also kind of a mentor figure for them. So it's not just about fitness, but also about like general life stuff. And um, what I would be wondering about is um, what do you see when you, you see people who are like not really sure what they should do and they're kind of deviated from the path that they should be on to achieve success and, and to live a great life? What kind of common patterns do you see amongst these people that prevent them from stepping on the right path for them? Well, it, it depends. Well, first off, it's, it's a very nuanced question. So it would depend on the actual individual, what they're struggling with. So a lot of people and including myself and including everybody, we have certain set points when it comes to every area of our life, right? So a set point, you know what a set point is when it comes to body fat loss, right? We know that there's a certain settling point yeah. after which if you go too low in body fat percentage, your body naturally makes you a little bit more hungrier, it's a little bit harder to maintain, and it takes a tremendous amount of time for you to actually be able to master staying below the set point or even try and change a little bit, and we don't know that yet based on the current body of evidence, right? But there are certain set points that work very mm -hmm. similarly in terms of your happiness, in terms of your business, in terms of the amount of success that you allow yourself to have. And I find that a lot of us are, are somewhat limiting ourselves in, in a sense that we have the set point and we don't realize where it's at. So we don't realize, okay, if it's, let's say, just use an income as an example, although income is really poorly correlated with happiness or anything like that. So I don't want people to misunderstand that. Beyond 75 grand a year, you're not gonna be any happier. If you double your income, you're getting 9% of happiness based on research in Princeton, right? So let's not correlate happiness with money, but let's use that as a, as a metric, right? Um, if you're making six figures a year, um, you will um, 
you will basically be stuck at that for a very, very long time mentally, not just because your business is stuck, but you're having that success where you're in that set point where you think you don't deserve more, you think that that is the amount that you should be doing. And I find that a lot of people that are extremely successful are because of the fact that they, they've managed to take off that limit and take off that, push that setting, setting point somewhere where they feel like, hey, this is what I deserve. They're just a little bit more entitled to it. They don't feel like um, that they have that, uh, that they, they have that break. And all of us are holding a, a break on ourselves, and I can see that happen all the time with my clients. But I, I mean, one common theme, let, let's go back to like commonality is what I see, and I, we, we talked about this a little bit before the interview, is that I see a lot of people living like they're gonna live forever, right? A lot of people are going day by day mm -hmm. like their life is gonna be infinite. And that's a little bit of a, that's a little bit of a problem because we human beings, we cannot see how short the, the lifespan truly is. I mean, days, as they say, days go, uh, I think the saying goes like they, uh, days are slow, years are fast. And that's the problem. Like you wake up yeah. and you're in your forties and your fifties, right? And, and I'm not saying that you cannot achieve success in your forties and your fifties and your sixties or whatever, but you will miss out on so much potential uh, ability to put out value and, and actually change the world and do something meaningful because you're so caught up in these day-to-day -day things and, and there's no sense of urgency. That sense of urgency that you can put on yourself, that self-accountability is much more important than having an accountability coach. Right? I mean, accountability coaching works really well, but self-accountability is what it's actually going to turn you into a, a whatever you want to achieve like your maximum potential you have to actually be able to hold yourself accountable what you're doing it, when nobody is watching you that's what really counts like when nobody's watching me here when i'm in my room right now i could be watching the latest episode of flash which i really love right or i could be doing content research and nobody's observing me nobody is actually looking at what i'm doing i can just open it up on my laptop there's no accountability and I have to push myself, and that's a skill set that um, I see a lot of people are struggling with, is just being able to detach that monkey brain that wants the instant gratification from the, the true purpose through the prefrontal cortex that is actually having that control. So understanding that there's a, there's a brain there that is sending you wrong signals that you have to be able to uh, guide to be able to take action when it doesn't feel right, when you, when you are looking for that instant gratification, but you wanna do, I mean, it's so hard to do something else at that point. Yeah, and yeah, I would say that that's the biggest one. Yeah, and and um, it's um, you know let's 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 talk about a little bit like how can people actually take action because because I think objectively a lot of people know even though if we look at statistics I mean most people are not successful unfortunately um, as sad as that sounds but even those people who are not successful objectively probably they know what they should do right i mean everybody kind of knows that hard work is good persistence is good um but what is it that actually prevents people from from doing it and my hypothesis and i and i guess there is a lot of evidence for it is that it comes down to like programming and conditioning right and just setting up the right behavioral systems for yourself yeah, I mean, th th that's, that's definitely on a high level, that is definitely true, that you have your self-image, you have your social conditioning, you have your, your thoughts there. But let's look at it at a micro level. Let's look at it at a day-to-day -day level, what is actually preventing you from taking action right now, today, and for most people. And I think it's the fact that people don't realize that they have a limited amount of a attention units, a attention um, ability throughout the day. So you can probably focus on like four or five things in a day, right? And if... Um, Three out of those five is your, your um, online shopping habits, what some celebrity did in a magazine, you're thinking about that. Um, you're browsing through Facebook, uh, you're having an argument with someone at work, and you have that number five, and now you wanna, I don't know, you wanna change the world, right? Pff, fuck, man, like there's <laughs> no way, like you have no chance, because your attention is constantly being, uh, being taken away, and not, not just by random stuff, but by everybody, right? Everybody uh, wants a piece of your uh, uh, attention, a piece of the thing that they have to put on your agenda. And until you can actually take control of your time, you won't be able to be successful. But I mean, success is about saying no, right? It's not about saying yes. People think it's like about doing more. It's about doing less shit. Because you have a 24 hour 
uh, period. And if you look at your 24 hour, you can inst like even just on your computer, you can install an app called Rescue Time. You can check like what websites you're uh, checking and what, where you're wasting your time. But look at your 24 hours, like think about the last couple of days and where did your attention go? Because we all, I mean, not all of us have the same capacity, but we can get pretty damn good at most things. And I, I feel like the biggest issue with a lot of people is just that we have that mental capacity, but we just give it away to some random stuff, like right? arguing with customer support over $5, right? Instead of creating a, a program or a video that's gonna change thousands of people's lives when money is not even gonna be important anymore because you're just having that sorted out because now you're giving so much value instead of you're arguing about uh, a post-it or something which costs like $2, right? So you, you spend like two hours on that. And I feel like that's taken away from a lot of people's success is the fact that um, they're not being very protective over their time. And that's the biggest asset. And yeah. not just time, but I mean energy and focus time. Because literally, if you, I mean, you, you mentioned Cal Newport and his, uh, his book, Deep Work. You have about two hours of focus time in a day, right? Like two to four hours. What are you spending that time on, right? That, that's, that's the key. Right? And, and you have to be very, very protective over that. Yeah, yeah, I guess that that's especially, I mean, speaking of Cal Newport, that's why he's so critical about, you know, social media and all of that stuff. And, you know, those points can be debated, but it, it is a matter of fact that in this modern technological age, it's especially to especially easy to always find a distraction. And it's like you said, it's 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 almost like a matter of saying no to things rather than making priority to do other things. Um, now. What, what I would be really wondering, and as I'm really great that you brought up this attentional limit, uh, is that, you know, people who are, are thinking about changing their, their behavior and changing their habits, I think a common issue often is not knowing what area of your lives to focus on, right? And just to bring myself up as an example, I'm really interested in per personal development and self-improvement, but when I'm kind of just analyzing what areas of my life I could improve. I mean, there are social skills, there are personal relationships, there are business skills, there's fitness, there is a whole bunch of stuff and it's almost anxiety producing, right? Because you want to do everything at the same yeah. time. So uh, how do you think people should prioritize the areas of their lives that they want to improve? That, that's an amazing question. I think that's, uh, that's a, the biggest issue that people struggle with, uh, especially people who watch videos like this one, which is totally niched in like this is one percent of the pop like 0.001 percent of the population is actually interested in that final maslow point of self-actualization right that's where most people are still in the just give me the shelter and food right and then some sex right um uh, moving uh i mean into that the first thing you want to do is get it out of your head right i think that a lot of these things are in our head and we cannot actually compute it and because of our limited mental capacity to to, to hold so much information in our head. So at first, write it down. Great example that I have on, <laughs> on this, uh, someone asked me recently, I mean, how do you, which area should I work on, right? How do I have this and this? And, and I asked him a simple question, well, could you calculate like, I don't know, 10 minus 500 plus 10,000 minus 50 plus 31 minus seven? No, it's probably difficult, right? You have to think about it for a long time, right? But if you write that same thing down on a piece of paper, you'd probably be able to calculate it in like four or five minutes, right? It would take you like 30 minutes probably to do it in your head. Yeah. So write it down, right? Do a, do a, I mean, I'm not a really big fan of writing things down. Like the old school Brian Tracy, Bob Proctor, like really write it down. But there's some truth to that. So download that on a piece of paper and see where you're at where you're at on a scale of one to 10, be as objective as possible. And not only yourself, but get someone who knows you really, really well to tell you where you're at. And then see which area needs to be prioritized. If you're eight out of 10 in fitness, and that's amazing, right? You're, you already got the 80% the there. Do you really need to get from eight to nine if your social skills are zero? I mean, think about it. Because you're missing the, the yeah. You're miss, missing the Pareto principle, which is the 20% will lead to 80%. So it's probably a better ROI if you invest more time in social skills where you're going to get that 80% and take your social skills from one to, to six. That's going to improve your life quality much more than taking your fitness now from eight to nine. Even though uh, you might be attracted to fitness at the moment because, of course, um, we are attracted to what we're good at. I mean, I, I hate dancing. I hate doing shit that I, that I suck exactly. at. I hate doing that, right? I love doing stuff that, I, oh, that I'm really, really good at. And it sucks when I have to do something that I, that I 
that I'm not skilled in. I really hate it. But I know because I suck there, that's why I have to do that. The, that's where my growth is and that's gonna contribute more. So just learning the basics of a couple of steps is probably gonna make my every night out, if, I mean, there's not that many, but when I do go out, it's probably increase my happiness that night by tri triple the amount, right? Just by l investing maybe five classes. And this is a simple example, but looking at every area, so it's not hard to, I mean, there's only four, right? If you look at health, if you look at business, social skills, and your purpose, your overall development, just look at where you're at. Just look at, and, and just ba put it on a piece of paper, where am I at, and where do I have that 20% not, uh, that's gonna give me 80% of results and not handled, and then invest time in that. And you're gonna get very, very far. You can, I mean, I would say that the priority obviously is health, I mean, at least in my opinion, that's just the way I like to organize things. Health and business are the priority. Um, although I, I don't devalue social skills at all, but I think you can be a, a, a little cave troll in your basement and still mm -hmm. make a ton of money and uh, be free financially and have great health, even without having, let's say, so well of a social circle, right? So it kind of, I, I would kind of put those below the health because if you're sick, you're, you're, you're gone, right? You're, you're done. Uh, in today's world, Finances aren't yeah, yeah. as critical simply from the fact that you're not going to die out of, for no hunger, right? Like you, there, there's no hunger, there's at least for the most part. So I would say that yeah. you have the basic sort out. You still have internet, you still have your iPhone, you know, you're not dying from, from these kind of things. So I would say that health would be the priority, uh, business, then obviously social skills. And then you, your overall purpose itself will, will automatically improve just by improving these areas. And the final point here is that all these areas are connected. This is a non-linear system. A human life is not a linear system. This is a huge system where one little thing in, in health and fitness can cause a ripple effect in your personal development, in your confidence, in your business. Just you by going there doing squats, you're, you're gonna be a better businessman, right? You're gonna be a better uh, person itself and more people yeah. wanna hang out with you, right? So it's not just that you're, it's like all or nothing. It is everything. It is really about maximizing your effort. And then when you have that effort, good things will happen. So regardless of which one you choose, you're going to move ahead for sure. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. I mean, uh, these are brilliant points. And just to summarize it for people, uh, you know, like if you're already a 9 out of 10 or an 8 out of 10 in something, I, I guess that's why so many kind of fitness people and that's why fitness kind of gains a bad rap amongst many people because it's easy to be hyper focused on fitness once you're good at it. And these are kind of the meatheads that people like to make fun of because because they already are proficient <laughs> yeah. in fitness. So it's, of course, gratifying to further improve that. But like you said, and that's the other thing that's point reiterating here is that taking an analysis perhaps on on 20 percent of things in your life that would bring 80 percent of the benefits or 20 percent uh, of the things that are causing 80 percent of the frustration in your life and maybe focus on changing those so so that is that is an amazing point so let's let's talk about a little bit um more about the practicality of this which is um behavior change and we already kind of touched on this in our last interview but um kind of rewiring ourselves and changing the way we operate is, is of course a huge topic and and that is, a, is an enormous challenge so kind of um do you think there is an easy way to break down the science of behavior change and how we can change the way we think and the way we act on a day-to-day -day basis like basically it comes down to habit formation right well th that's a that's a fantastic question i would say that it is definitely not easy I mean, that, that's not the word, but it is kind of simple. It is kind of simple, right? Because it, it, a lot of things handle themselves, right? And what I would, when I say handle themselves, I think that uh, investing in certain keystone habits eventually result in you becoming better at a lot of other things that you didn't even plan to do, become better at. Let's say you're, you, you all of a sudden mastered the habit, and we're gonna go ahead and get into the practice just for the viewers. Let's say you, you increase your sleep from like six to eight hours. Now, all of a sudden, just the fact that you did that, you're more focused on your work, you have more willpower, you can get better at that, you, you're stronger in the gym, you get more results from that, you, you burn more body fat, and you lose less muscle mass on a diet, you probably build some muscle if you're a beginner, and um, your overall happiness just jumps up very, very high. It's just from one thing, just by increasing your sleep from six to eight hours, 
right? Just by going to bed a little bit earlier, now you got all these benefits. And this is what a lot of people are missing, the fact that there are certain keystone things that, are, that have to be handled before everything else is, so you don't focus on those tiny little things. Let's just go back to habit formation, right? Because uh, we know that we talked about before, there's a limited capacity for active conscious change or active conscious effort. And we know that this is pretty well established in terms of research that self-control is somewhat limited when it comes to things that you're not enjoying. Right, there's a little hack when it comes to willpower, which is if you actually enjoy the thing that you're doing, uh, even though if you have to force yourself a little bit for it, if it puts you in flow, it's not going to drain your willpower, right? So there's a little bit of a nuance there as well. It's not just that self-control leads to less willpower. But uh, the secret, quote unquote, to bypassing the need for willpower is obviously building habits, right? Habits are your brain putting a behavior in autopilot because now it has done it so many times that it values and prioritizes that habit and it's just gonna put it as an automatic behavior so you're not gonna need effort anymore you're not gonna need that uh, self-control anymore so for me right now if you tell me don't go to the gym I'm gonna have a hard time doing that because my new default is to train six seven days a week right if you tell me you need to lie in bed all day I'll, I'll probably shoot myself right I can't do that because my new default is something else. So my brain rewired to have a new default. And what's kind of the key, I guess, to create those habits? So the analogy, and I'm gonna go full practical because theoretically what people like to use the theories is of the trigger, action, reward. You know, you have a trigger, you have action, reward. I don't find that very practical. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, that's great to know, but how the hell do you, uh, how, do you <laughs> how do you apply that, right? That's from the book, The Power of Habit, Charles Dewey, right? What do you do with that, right? I have the graph yeah, and yeah, I'm yeah. looking at it. Um, the, the way you, the, the way I look at habits right now, it, it's kind of like a plant, right? So I have, so have this little plant, right? And um, the roots of the plant, roots of, of the growth is your repetition. And the roots grow regardless of how, uh, regardless of how intense or big the plant is. So let, let, let's go deeper into the analogy, right? So by you doing reps, even if it's a tiny little habit, you're building the roots that can sustain the actual outcome, which is the, the growth of the plant. Because when a lot of people focus on in habits, they focus on the actual outcome and on how big the behavior is. And that's the plant, that's the tree eventually. But the roots are the repetition. So the first focus should be having solid roots and then you can upgrade the, the actual plant size and the outcome and the, and the intensity of the habit. So what that simply means is that if you start very, very tiny by, let's say, you, you have a hard time meditating, you don't want to start with 55 minutes or 60 minutes of meditation, even 20 minutes, because that's a huge plant and you have zero roots. And you're trying to build something on, on, on yeah. there where there's no foundation. Instead, if you were building the roots, meaning if you meditated for a minute every day, like just a freaking minute while you're making coffee in the morning or while you're preparing your breakfast, you spend a minute of conscious meditation, active meditation, transcendent or whatever, you know, you can pick any, but it's the point that you're doing it every day, you're gonna build a very strong root and then you can scale the plant size, you can scale the habit from one to two to three to four to five to 10 minutes, eventually or 20, whatever you wanna do. But the root is the foundation that has to be managed. And the beauty of this is that the root itself isn't just the repetition and the habit, it is your identity. Am I the type of person that meditates yeah. if I'm doing 15 seconds of meditation every day? Yes, I am. I am. I'm the type of person that meditates. Am I the type of person that meditates if I'm doing 20 minutes a day? Yes, I am, right? So I'm taking the chance to reinforce that identity every single day. So if I do one single push-up, I'm still the person that is exercising. I'm still the person who's doing that. And over time, what happens is that your brain will see, okay, this thing is being repeated so many times. Let's put it on autopilot because it just doesn't make any sense to think about it because it's just gonna happen, right? So you don't need willpower to tie your shoes. Similarly, you won't need willpower to do meditation anymore when it becomes a habit. And I would say that understanding habits, uh, starting small and tiny, what it does as well is is eliminates the need for motivation. As you don't need motivation to, to do a single push-up, right? If I tell yeah. you right now, do five push-ups, you can just 
get up your chair and do five push-ups right then and there. You don't need any motivation for that. You don't need any willpower for that. You don't need anything special or some kind of magical plan, but you are still growing the roots and building the identity. And now here's the caveat to this, right? Um, certain behavior can be so small that it's not motivating you to do that behavior because you cannot see the impact of it. And this is where you have to totally. be able to, totally. number one, either brainwash yourself that you're building the root, which is basically understanding the, 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 the habit formation effects. So you know that the investment in small things will, you trust the process that is going to work one day. Or number two is actually find the sweet spot of the behavior. So it's just a tiny little bit of hard so you can see that there's an outcome from that, but it's also not too hard where it's not motive, like it's not just crushing you and you're not making it sustainable. So it's kind of having that workout plan that is 20 minutes maybe in the gym, right? Instead of a, a, a one push-up, right? And some people are okay with doing one push-up because I'm, I'm not yeah. the type of person that's gonna do one push-up. I'm gonna do at least 20 minutes, right? But I find that if I do one hour, I'm probably not gonna be able to sustain it. So with meditation, I pick like five minutes instead of 15 seconds, right? So I found a sweet spot between 20 minutes and 15 seconds, yeah. which works for me. So find the intensity of the plant that you can sustain without having strong roots, but work on the roots, work on the repetition. Otherwise, uh, the plant doesn't even matter. Before you master the reps, the habit, it doesn't even matter. Yeah, yeah I guess it's, um, you know, I, I don't know about you, but I, I kind of formed like a hypothesis for myself or, or kind of like almost like an affirmation, which, which says that kind of successful people Paul, differ from not successful people in that they're able to do the things that they're supposed to do even during times when they're not motivated. Because the thing is that our lives are not consisting of like New Year's Eves, right? Or super motivational seminars with Tony Robbins. Most of our days are just normal yeah. every days, a Monday morning or a Tuesday morning when we have to get up. And even though it's not very inspiring of an environment, we still need to do what we need to do. And I guess the way to think about it well is motivation is an emotion that gets us to do hard things. And the only way that we can manage this is either to be motivated all the time, which is not gonna happen, or to make the things that we need to do a little bit easier so we don't need as much motivation. And, and I love that you talked about this also in the last interview that um, you kind of need to set a threshold and just do the things that are under that threshold where you don't need that much motivation to accomplish it. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that's the well, well put, there's a threshold. Right, right. Um, so now we talked about kind of the general philosophies. We also talked about the practicalities. What would you recommend for people when they fall off the wagon? Because we set up a habit and we, we decide the action steps, but you know, life will get in the way here and there. Um, even for you with your everyday videos, I mean, you got fucking robbed in Mexico, right? So um, you need to get back on the track. I guess it was challenging for you actually to like start again from a couple of days of break. Um, what do you recommend for people in these kind of instances? Uh, de <laughs> develop the skill of forgetting. Uh, develop the skill of uh, being able to detach yourself with what happened in the past. So it's, um, it's almost a little bit stoic, you know, you have your only this moment right now. And I feel like a lot of us, when let's say you fall off track with your fitness and nutrition, you almost, you almost feel like you lost an investment or as if, you've, um, it, as if it's gonna be for some reason, oh, I put so much effort into this and now I didn't do it for a while and now I'm losing that investment or I, or I lost my chain with videos or I lost my, my, uh, my I'm not on track, I'm not on my purpose. It, it's, it's really, a, again, it's about bouncing back. Uh, the ability of, of what, what success really is, I mean, if you, if you look at how people are operating on a day-to-day -day basis, is their ability to bounce back after they fall off track. That, that's what really it is. Like, I mean, it's, it's never a straight line. And thinking that it's going to be a straight line is, is completely delusional. That's just not going to happen ever on this planet to nobody. There's never ever a straight line. Even if it does look like a straight line, if you really know someone who think it's like a straight line of success, just go and talk to them a little bit and, and dig a little bit deeper. Because we feel like it's, uh, we feel like that, I mean, as I mentioned before, that iceberg illusion, we think that it's simple because we see the last part of the 
the, the, the success curve, we see that just the, we see the Kobe that is hitting three pointers or is making 80 point games and he's now retired, but <laughs> we don't see him waking up at 4 a.m. doing 5,000 free shots before everybody else is awake. When they're all like sleeping, still his teammates and he's waking up an hour earlier so he can have the, the field for himself to do some practice runs before. So his coach is sleeping, everybody's sleeping. And uh, we don't see these moments. And that's kind of what, the, what I would say is when you do fall off track, the only secret is literally bouncing back faster every time you fall off. That's the secret, right? As yeah. fast as you can, like instant uh, is if possible, but it's never instant. Obviously, you need some time. But over time, it gets easier and you're faster to detach yourself from that emotion that you get because that, that emotion that you hit, like feeling bad that you've fallen off, if you cut it out, come back, and not think that you're entitled for something because you've done something in the past, like you, you're thinking like, oh, I'm entitled now to, do, to get something because I've done it something in the past, which is, again, a delusion. Uh, you, you don't deserve anything that, uh, except for the fact that you wor work for it. So you, you get only what you work for. Yeah, yeah, I guess it's the same as with like dieting. I mean, you know, people who maintain a great six packs, people like you or, or anybody who people admire in this space, uh, you know, every once in a while shit happens. I mean, people overeat, eat, you know, like you may, you may have, uh, you know, a restaurant meal that went a little bit overboard. Big deal. I mean, the next day you get back on track over time, that caloric surplus will kind of cancel out and things just go around their course as they used to. Yeah, I mean, one, one thing I'd like to add here, it, it doesn't matter what happens on your exception, it matters what happens on your default day. Absolutely. People don't get successful because their default days aren't right. It's not that they don't get successful because when they, are, when they have a, a fever and they're, they have a family reunion for Christmas that they don't go to the gym at that time. No, it's the day when you're at home, when you don't have anything to do, and that's where you decide to stay home and not do shit instead of actually taking action. That's where you fail. You don't fail at those exceptions. You fail at not creating your default day to be the day that leads to success, right? So that, that's just the one I want to point out. And default day is 80% of the time. You're always going to get sick at least once a year. Most likely for a lot of people, there's going to be a couple of incidents a year. Some shit will happen eventually. And that's normal, right? But the 80% of the time when, when shit is not happening, when it's the default day, that's where it's at. That's where the result is coming from. The boring, annoying, uh, super, super lazy day when you, for, when you get yourself to go to the gym. That's where success really happens. It's not the day that you fall off. Yeah, that, that's why it's fun to run these numbers sometimes. Like um, sometimes I even uploaded a video about this. I used to get very anxious when I didn't get enough sleep. You know, like I maybe I just slept five hours or something and I would like beat myself up over it and almost get like anxiety problems because of it and then i kind of ran the math that okay over the course of my lifetime i will have to sleep something like two hundred fifty thousand hours or something does it really matter that on this particular day i got three hours less not really so it's um it's, it's kind of fun to play around with these things a little bit um so you know man just before we start wrapping up uh, why don't we give a concrete example of like some maybe some habit or some behavior that you kind of fought your way out of that was like a negative habit and you mastered it and kind of uh, tr changed it consciously. I know, for example, that you mentioned that you, you were kind of food focused because of a lot of dieting and caloric deficit, and then you had to work on it consciously to bring yourself out of being food focused. I, I know you mentioned it in a video. Maybe you can talk about, about that, but anything else that comes to mind? Well, the biggest one I would say that I really had to cut out is being distracted while I'm supposed to be doing something else, I would allow distractions to come in. So it's more like I was open to being distracted when I was supposed to be working. So right now, when I do my work in Evernote, uh, Chrome is closed, room is closed, phone is on airplane mode, and I just work. And that allows me to finish the work that I would normally take three, four hours when I was getting those micro interruptions that, I mean, just a single email that you read is not just that email that you read, it's 25 minutes out of flow, it takes you back to get into mm -hmm. the flow. So you lose four or five hours just for the fact that you read that stupid email, which might be a promo. And it's usually not that important to even reply within an hour to anybody, right? So I would say that uh, managing my time with just being less distracted is 
probably the hardest thing that I had to do because I'm the kind of a, I'm kind of ADD a little bit, right? I'm I'm very uh, into I'm th- trying to multitask as many I'm trying to be as efficient as possible, and eliminating multitasking is probably the the by far the thing that I've noticed that makes me a lot more happier and productive by far by far more than anything right. else just by the fact that I realized okay you cannot multitask your sh- stuff out of this you have to sit down single task get it out of the way and then you can focus on something else and that led to something that takes five hours to finish be finished in one hour and I get extra four hours to do something else and it's by far the most productive thing I've, I've ever done <laughs> I think in my whole life yeah yeah I mean um you echo my sentiment completely because uh, because that's been a huge game changer for me ever since I read Deep Work <laughs> from Cal Newport two times. Um, so yeah, yeah, gr- great tip. Um, all right, just before I ask my my last question, is there any kind of uh, resource or book I don't know that that you would recommend on on these topics that we discussed today, or just people to follow? Well, I can give you my my five that I generally recommend to people as a starting point to start getting into the field of uh, personal development of reading more. Um, I would say that uh, No Excuses by Brian Tracy, uh, my absolute favorite mm-hmm. book of all time when it comes to personal development. Uh, get the long version. It's it's fantastic. It covers all the areas of your life. It doesn't go super in depth in saying, hey, here's how much protein you should eat and here's the research. It's more like, okay, here's what the general principles are that it, uh, that will make you successful in any area, right? So that's a very, very good book of uh, just to start out to kind of hook yourself into this. Uh, second one I generally recommend is uh, called Bounce by Matthew Said. It's a book that talks about mm. um, how hard work is probably more important than talent, right? If you just, I mean, working yourself, uh, working hard is is extremely important. Bouncing back, that's that's what the book is about. Like truly bouncing back when you fall off track. That's what success is, mm-hmm. right? It's a very, very important book that I've read and um, introduced me to the whole concept of mastery, 10,000 hours of practice, really putting in the effort into one single thing instead of delude, like just trying to do everything and being this delusion that you can become a jack of all trades and, be, and become successful in everything, which is just, I mean, it's ridiculous to even think about that. And then um, moving on a little bit more nuanced, I would say is The Happiness Advantage, which uh, by Sean Aker, he talks a lot about what makes someone happy. And it's a really cool book. I think, I mean, we all, uh, the, the question of what makes people happy is probably the oldest question in the world. And I think that's, um, very important for us to educate ourselves a little bit more on, on what truly will make us happy because we have a lot of data we even have the data we don't even look at the data we can see the regrets of uh, of, of the dying we can see this the data we ignored that right and we already know what kind of makes us ha- more happy but we just don't do it so it's important to educate ourselves a little bit it's not gonna I mean I don't think a lot of people will apply every single piece of advice from that book or any other book but it's gonna not you in the right direction so it's a really cool one um, another one, uh, going back to when I said uh, it's about saying no, uh, a book called Essentialism. It's fantastic. It's a book where you're going to, it, it's a book that is going to introduce you to what is truly essential in your life, what is the thing that is bringing you value, what is the thing that causes you stress, or what is the thing that's not leading to success that's just taking your time. Extremely, extremely recommended uh, book, uh, Essentialism. And the final one, um, a little bit more wooverish now, which is like really uh, one of my personal favorites is Psycho-Cybernetics, uh, because we talked a bit about uh, reprogramming our self-image to lim- eliminate these uh, beliefs that we have that are holding us back. So Maxwell Maltz, uh, Psycho-Cybernetics, by far the best book on the topic, it, by far. The father of self-image, of identity change, uh, behavior change, definitely check him out. And of course, in terms of nutrition, I think our list is pretty similar. I mean, um, if guys who are watching this, uh, I mean, if you're not following Brad Schoenfeld, James Krieger, Alan Aragon, Brett Contreras, Eric Helms, uh, and the whole 3D Muscle Journey team, Menno Henselmans, uh, Lyle McDonald, you know, like Stefan Guillenet is one of my favorites when it comes to obesity research. Uh, there's a couple of really cool Facebook groups, uh, groups by... Uh, Antonis uh, guy runs a book called, uh, runs a group called uh, Smart Training and Flexible Dieting, which is a really cool one on, on Facebook, which is a lot of discussion. 
um, on YouTube. Uh, Omar Isaf is, is evidence-based and he's pretty solid. I mean, just a couple of resources for guys that really want to dive into the evidence-based fitness and nutrition side of things. That would be a pretty good place to be at. Yeah, and I would highly recommend people to follow you, Mario, on on Goodreads because uh, there there they can see a lot of good book recommendations. I actually got a lot lot from you. Yeah, actually, I I think I came across Talent is overrated on your your reading list. I think it was, yeah, by Jeff yeah, Col no. Jeff Colvin. I yeah. think the <laughs> author. Yeah, amazing amazing book. I would highly recommend it to everyone. Yeah, I um, love those talent books. There there's a there's a bunch of them like the Talent Code, uh, Bounds, uh, Talent is overrated. There there's a bunch of them that if you read all the books, they're pretty similar, but they all hammer on a little bit of different nuances and it takes uh, like four or five books on the talent myth to actually be able to understand what it's about. You know, you need repetition. It's not just about one book. Yeah, and, and I think even if science one day will prove that all successful traits are genetic and inheritory and you can't work on it and whatever, I think it is all of our best interest to like not believe it and believe that these things can all be developed because whatever the truth is, you have one life and you have one option and that is to try and, and not care about whether it is genetic or whatever and just make the effort and, and crush it. So, yeah. All right. Well said, man. <laughs> some motivational input to the end uh, um all right man i think think uh, this has been an awesomely informative uh, interview and thank you so much for taking the time uh do you want to tell people where they can find you and and what resources of yours would you recommend to them well the best place to start and the best place to stay in touch would be my youtube channel i would say that's going to be linked in the description below probably or in the comments you'll probably see a comment from me in this and um, you can also add on social media if you search my name. I would say YouTube channel is probably a place where you're going to be able to cherry pick the, the topics and the content that you would want to learn the most about. And you can just check out all the videos and see which ones resonate the most with you. And I would say that's probably the best idea. And then you can see if something resonates with you and um, you want to learn more about it, probably do a search on the channel. I, I covered it from multiple angles. So things like happiness, personal development, fitness, getting ripped, jacked, big shredded whatever your goal is um, you're gonna find something and uh, a lot of resources in every video description so you can dig deeper down the rabbit hole if you're interested so yeah definitely the YouTube channel awesome yeah and highly recommend your YouTube channel because it is really awesome I, I watch all, all the videos you put out uh, because they're really high quality <laughs> thanks man all right guys I hope you enjoyed this interview with Mario Tomic before we wrap this episode up fully, let's rehash some of the most important lessons from this episode. Number one, there are always things to improve in your life and deciding which areas to focus on can be challenging and many times it can be tempting to hyper focus on one area that we are already kind of proficient at. So for example, for me, most of my fitness related habits are in place already. Uh, I don't have to battle with myself to go to the gym or eat whole foods. These things are dialed in and are inherently rewarding for me for the most part. So it would make probably more sense for me, for example, to try to increase my social skills, to become a little less awkward socially, you know, learn to smile more, things like that. Um, and I have a lot more to improve in these regards. So that way I will take an area of my life where I'm currently maybe a 4 out of 10 and try to achieve a score of a 6 or a 7 out of 10 instead of trying to take an area where I'm already an 8 out of 10 and try to make huge efforts to become an 8.5 or a 9 out of 10. So my suggestion to you would be sit down and take a look at your life and what are the small number of things in your life that are causing most of the frustration. Now, of course, try to pick things that are within your control. So don't say, well, I wish I could be eight feet tall because that will be tricky to achieve. But once you identify these areas, decide to shift some of your attention units to that area and try to bring it up a little. And maybe this will mean that some other areas that are already at a very high level will receive a little bit less attention for a while. And this can be weird at first. For example, now I train only five days a week instead of seven days a week, which trust me, after training seven days a week for many months, just felt weird as hell at first. 
but ultimately I realized that I have an extra two hours or so per day to dedicate to something else entirely, like cultivating my brain, for example. Second big lesson, behavior change and changing ourselves is something we all think about from time to time, but how we get there and how we make it a reality is of course the trickier part. Um, I mean, the typical cycle for most of us goes something like this. We are unpleased with ourselves for a long time, then we get fed up, then we get fired up to change, then we commit to the change for a little while, then we get discouraged, and then we revert back to our original behavior. And there are conflicting opinions on how to change your behavior, but it seems like the best we can offer right now is this. Start small. Start something that is easy, and then do it again and again. And when I say easy, I mean, it's so easy that you can do it on a day when you're tired, sleep deprived, and just had a terrible day at work. If you can say it with at least 95% certainty that you can commit to your habit on a day like that, then it's a good starting point. Uh, once you could adhere to that habit for a while, for a couple of weeks at least, then you basically earn the permission to increase the intensity. Then you can set more ambitious plans. The point is, Whatever plan you set, it has to work on the bad days as well. Because really, motivation is fickle. Sometimes it's high, sometimes it's low. And when you make these grandiose plans in your most motivated state, it's a little bit like a pro bodybuilder prescribing his own workout plan to an obese guy who never lifted a weight. It's just not a very rational call. Which brings me right away to point number three, which is you have to master the skill of going easy on yourself if you slip off. Now, of course, being self-critical can be a useful thing. In fact, some people would greatly benefit from not going too easy on themselves all the time. But, but if you're an ambitious person and you set a goal and you make a slip up, maybe you've overeaten, maybe you didn't work on your project that day, whatever it may be, learning to acknowledge a little slip up and then making a quick turnaround is an invaluable skill because ultimately it's easy to be on the right track when you haven't made a slip up in many weeks. It's empowering and encouraging, but being on point when you've just made a mistake, that's where the real mental strength comes in. The way I phrased it for myself is mastering moderation is the killer skill of the 21st century. So these would be the main takeaways for me. Um, like I said, Mario is a really smart, really genuine and very humble guy. And in fact, I'd like to share something that he told me outside of this interview. I asked him, uh, you know, man, I've been thinking about doing some daily YouTube videos the way you're doing it, but I'm not sure. I mean, I have this podcast. Maybe I should just focus on that. I don't know if uploading a YouTube video every day is a good idea. What do you think? And he told me, well... The only way to know it is by trying it. Uh, upload 100 videos and see what happens. And then he kind of started to laugh and, and told me, uh, but dude, I'm sure you knew already that this was going to be my answer. So really, this is what I like about this guy. He really makes a point that we can debate all the details and the complex strategies for success, but ultimately, if you're not doing the simple things that yield big results, ask yourself why you're not doing it already. So uh, with this rather long wrap up, uh, I would like to thank for your attention. Uh, please go ahead and uh, leave a rating on iTunes at the Sustainable Self Development Podcast. Of course, check out Mario's stuff on uh, his YouTube channel where you can find him under his name, Mario Tomic. Also check out his website on shockingfit.com if you're interested in being coached and mentored by him. And with that, I thank you for your attention and see you all next time.